Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome my dear sisters to the youth special Lailatul Qadar program with our beloved Ustaza, Ustaza Zikra Zakir Naik, Ustaza Ratibah Mahak, as well as Ustaza Rushda Zakir Naik. My name is Nashra and I will be your host for today. Before we begin, let us just go through a few house rules for the session today. The first one, kindly keep your microphone and camera or video switched off at all times. Inshallah, if time permits, there will be some question and answer sessions after the presentation, but kindly, kindly, we request that the questions are pertaining to the presentation and topic being discussed. Um, and there should be no questions about uh, that is unnecessary because when you type your questions in the chat box, it will appear on screen and this can be distractive for the other sisters. So please, if we can obtain your cooperation on this matter. The third one is many sisters ask about how to join uh, the group, both the WhatsApp group as well as the Telegram group. The links to these groups will be posted in the chat box. So please click on the link and you will automatically be part of the groups. As for the slides and recording of today's session, it will be made available on the Facebook pages of Aris uh, as well as Ustazah Farhad's uh, page respectively. And this will be done after the session. So with no further ado, sisters, I would now like to invite Ustaza Zikra Zakir Naik to continue with her presentation entitled, What If This Is Your Last Ramadan? Ustaza Zikra, it is now all yours.
الحمد لله الذي لا يخيب من دعاه الحمد لله الذي لا تخفى عليه قافية الحمد لله مفرج الكروب مقاضي الحاجات والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون هذه سيسة الإسلام I welcome you all with the Islamic greetings السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the glorious Qur'an, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Of these messengers, we raised some above the others in ranks. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created messengers, He made the best of them ulul azm. And, and out of them, He made the best of them Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the days of the week, he made Friday the best day. Similarly, when he created months, he made Ramadan the best of them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once told his companions, Ataakum shahru Ramadan, shahrun mubarak, tuftahu abuabu al-jannah, wa tughlaqu abuabu al-nar. فيه ليلة خير من ألف شهر من حرم خيرها فقد حرم وفي رواية قال وفيه تصفد الشياطين وفي رواية قال وينادى في كل يوم يا باغي الخير أقبل ويا باغي الشر أقصر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم once told his companions Year has come to you the month of Ramadan a month in which the gates of Jannah are open and the gates of hell are shut. In it there is a night better than a thousand months. Whoever is deprived of its blessings is truly deprived. It's also mentioned in this month the shayateen are chained. And it's also mentioned in this month it is called upon every day. O doer of good, increase in your good deeds. So O doers of good, hasten towards your Lord. Here is the month of Ramadan. تَقَرَّبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Let's get closer to our Lord. And the more the slave tries to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal gets closer to him. It's mentioned in a hadith Qudsi, إِذَا تَقَرَّبَ الْعَبْدُ إِلَيَّ شِبْرًا تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا وَإِذَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبْتُ مِنْهُ بَاعًا وَإِذَا أَتَانِي يَمْشِي أَتَيْتُهُ هَرْوَلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When a slave of mine draws near to me a span, I draw near to him a cubit. And if he draws near to me a cubit, I draw near to him a fathom. And if he comes to me walking, I go to him running. Subhanallah. And every night in Ramadan, Allah slaves his chosen slaves from the fire. It's mentioned in a hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna lillahi kulla fitrin utaqa wa thalika fi kulli layla. Allah azza wa jal saves people from the fire at every breaking of the fast and that happens every night of Ramadan. I pray Allah, Allah azza wa jal makes us amongst them. I mean, and fasting categorically is amongst the deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the most. Allah says in a hadith Qudsi, Kullu amal ibn Adam yudha'af, al-hasanatu ashru amthaliha ila sab'amiyati dha'af. Qala Allahu azza wa jal, illa as-sawm, fa innahu li wa ana ajzi bih. Allah azza wa jal is so, so merciful. He says that every good deed that we do, he rewards us. He rewards us multiply from 10 times to 700 times. 
And this is because of the, of the generosity of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is because of the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala continues and says, with the exception of fasting, it is for me and I shall reward for it. He Azza wa Jal says that for fasting, the reward is something else. He puts fasting in a special category. And I want you all to reflect on this for a second. Why? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put fasting in the special category? Why is it something so dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because, because Allah says, that human being gave up their desire for my sake. And that's powerful. Whenever we give up something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, it's so, so heavy in the scale. It's something very beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Because of this thing called sacrifice. That sacrifice is what's powerful. Its reward is something that could be infinite. Sisters, the days are flying by. The days of Ramadan are going to be in soon. Ramadan is going to leave us soon. Last Ramadan flew by. And before we, before we know it, this Ramadan would be gone too. And how many people they witnessed last Ramadan and now they are lying there down in their graves, wishing they could at least witness one day of this holy month. And who knows? This may be the last Ramadan for some of us. Now coming to what is the purpose of fasting? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 183, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. Allah says, O oh, you have believed, fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say that the purpose of fasting is so that you remain hungry or that you remain thirsty or that you face the pain of the poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned one reason, whereas the other reasons are all interrelated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just said, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may gain taqwa, piety, God consciousness. And the taqwa is in the heart. Fasting deals with your heart. And what happens in this holy month is that we are starving the body, but we are feeding the soul. We are not eating, we are not providing food to the body, but we are giving food to the soul. And why is this so important? Because let's be honest, sisters, most of our lives, they are spent in feeding the body. Most of our lives, we focus on our physical needs, right? Our physical selves. So I feel hungry, I want to eat. I'm thirsty, I want to drink. I'm feeling cold, I want to warm up myself. I have a desire and I fulfill it. So we take a lot of efforts to fulfill our physical needs, but many of us neglect the spiritual needs. Many of us neglect the needs of our hearts and the needs of our souls. So Allah Azza wa Jal, out of his mercy, he makes the requirement to feed our souls in this blessed month. Allah is requiring us to feed our souls through fasting. If your stomach fasted, but your eyes didn't from watching the haram, your ears didn't from hearing the haram, then what's the use of fasting? If fasting doesn't change our spiritual well-being, then what is the point of fasting? So if a person on normal day is using tobacco backbiting, slandering, gossiping, lying, listening to music, and while fasting too, he does the same, then what is the need of him giving up his food and drink? It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
whoever does not give up false speech and evil deeds while fasting, then Allah Azza wa Jal is not in need of him leaving his food and his drink. Fasting isn't something outward, just no eating and drinking, no. What's the main reason? You fast because you love the one who has prescribed fasting. You love Allah Azza wa Jal and you fast for his sake. You love him more than you love your food and drink. And you love him so much that no matter, even if it gets hard on you, but if he has prescribed it, you do it because you love him. You do it for his love, Azza wa Jal. Now let's move on to the golden opportunities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us every Ramadan. Three golden opportunities. There are three ahadiths Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about how we can have our sins forgiven in this holy month. The first one Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man saama Ramadanan imanan wa ihtisaba ghufira lahu ma taqadda min dhambi. He who observes fasting during the month of Ramadan with faith, that is Iman, while seeking its reward from Allah, will have his past sins forgiven. So the requirements here are whoever fasts in Ramadan with Iman, that is faith, and hoping the reward from Allah, then they will have their past sins forgiven. So the two requirements are just having Iman and hoping the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second golden opportunity, Surah Allah وسلم, says, Man qama Ramadanan iman wa ihtisaba, ghufira lahu ma taqadda min dhambi. Whoever stands in prayer, that is the optional taraweeh, the tahajjud prayer at night, during the month of Ramadan, with iman, that is faith. And in the hope of receiving Allah's reward, will have his past sins forgiven. Whereas the third hadith says, Man qama laylat al-qadr, imanan wa ihtisaba, ghufira lahu ma taqadda min dhambi. Whoever performs qiyam during laylat al-qadr, that is, a light, that is the night of decree, with faith, that is iman, while seeking its reward from Allah, will have his past sins forgiven. So the only two conditions mentioned in all these three ahadiths above are having Iman, that is faith, and hoping for Allah's reward. That's it. That's how easy it is, sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala count us amongst them. Amin. Now let's quickly talk about a few acts that should be done in this holy month. So number one, al-ikhlas, that is sincerity. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Actions will be based upon one's intentions. And each one will be rewarded according to his intentions. Every single action we do depends on our intentions. It's so important that the Prophet ﷺ said, for any deed to be accepted, our intentions have to be right first. So all the other points to come have to include this first main point that is ikhlas. That is the requirement of your intentions to be right and sincere. Also to maximize our reward, we can have multiple intentions for one act of worship. We shall discuss that in the coming points. Moving on to the next point, the morning and the evening of God. Ramadan is the best time to mold yourself and get, and get yourself into the habit of any good deed. The evening and morning adhkars protect from the evil and it's like a fortress built against the shayateen. The du'as in these adhkars hold immense thawab and is an investment of time that is truly worth it. Why do I say so? So it's mentioned in the hadith that whoever says, Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arsh al azim, which means, Allah is sufficient for me. There is none worthy of worship but Him. 
I have placed my trust in him. He is the Lord of the majestic throne. Whoever says this to her seven times in the morning, as well as seven times in the evening, what do y'all think is the reward? The reward is that Allah Azza wa Jal will take care of his affairs in this world as well as the next. Don't we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take care of our affairs? That's how easy it is, sisters. It's also mentioned in a hadith who says, رَضِيتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينَا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا, Which means, whoever says thrice in the morning and thrice in the evening, I am pleased with Allah as my Lord, with Islam as my religion, and Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم as my messenger, that it's upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him happy on the day of judgment. I'm sure none of us would want to lose on such, on such easy and great salab. Now the timing for the morning adhkar is from after fajr until before sunrise. And the evening adhkar from after asr until before maghrib. So let's try hard to stick on to them. Moving on to point number three, reading the Quran, memorizing it, Understanding it and pondering and pondering over it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 185. Shahru Ramadan al Ladi unzila fi hil Quran, Hudalin Nasi wa Bayinatin min al Huda wal Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say unzila fi hil jihad or unzila fi hil zakah. Allah says, Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. It is the month of the Qur'an. You know, when we are all asked who, we, who do we love the most, we immediately say Allah. If I was to tell you your best friend send you a letter in a different language, what would you do? Wouldn't you try your best to get it translated? Wouldn't you try your best to understand it? Come what may, you would do that. Why? Because you love her, right? We all say we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al-a'la. But when Allah sent down his book, and if we don't know the Arabic language, how much of an effort do we take to understand it? To implement it? to practice and to preach it. Whatever remains of this blessed month, let's make it one of our goals that we will firstly understand a portion of the Quran. And let us do this every single day. And secondly, let's memorize a part of the Quran, whether it be few verses in these blessed nights, whether it be small surahs, the last two verses of Baqarah Ali Imran, but let's memorize something new and make it a target to finish it before the end of Ramadan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man qara'a harfan min kitab Allah, falahu bihi hasana, wal hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha. La aqulu alif lam mimun harfun, walakin alifun harfun, walamun harfun, wa mimun harf. Whoever recites a letter from the Book of Allah, he will be credited with a good deed. And a good deed gets a tenfold reward. I do not say that Alif Lam Mim is one letter, but Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, and Mim is a letter. Subhanallah. That's how much sawab one would get easily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Hashr, verse number 21. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. Had we sent down this Quran on a mountain, you would surely have seen it humbling itself and rending asunder by the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in Surah Ahzab wa Sama 72, Inna aradna al-amanata ala al-samawati wal-ardi wal-jibali fa-abayna an yahmilnaha wa ashfaqna minha 
وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. And they declined to bear it and feared it. But man undertook it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Yes, we. You and I, we took it upon ourselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to us. It was narrated that Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Quran will come on the day of resurrection like a pale man saying to its companion, do you recognize me? I'm the one who made you stay up at nights and made you thirsty during the day. Then he will be given dominion in his right hand and eternity in his left. And a crown of dignity will be placed upon his head. And his parents will be clothed with garments which far surpass everything to be found in this world. They will say, Oh Lord, how did we earn this? It will be said to them, Because you taught your child the Quran. Nowadays, what do we teach our children, sisters? If they've learned a few surahs here and there, we think they've done, they've done enough. We give precedence to all the worldly education over the Quran. Yes, a student should have the knowledge of both the worlds, no doubt. But why do we not give the Quran its importance? Verily, sisters, that is what's going to benefit you and me on the day of resurrection. On the day a mother will run away from her own child. The day the sun will be split open. The day no one would recognize one another. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us goodness. Moving on to the next point, that is praying two rak'ahs of duha prayer. And this is definitely keeping in mind, inshallah, that all of us are consistent with our fara'il, that is the five obligatory prayers. So praying to raka'ahs of the duha prayer, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically set up the duha prayer. In the morning, every single joint of yours must be a sadaqah. Every subhanallah is a sadaqah. Every alhamdulillah is a sadaqah. Every la ilaha illallah is a sadaqah. Every Allahu Akbar is a sadaqah. Every commanding good is a sadaqah. And every forbidding evil is a sadaqah. And all this is accomplished through two rak'ahs one can pray in duha prayer. So its time starts from 15 to 20 minutes after sunrise until 15 to 20 minutes before the duhar prayer. So let's try hard to stick on to it. The next is praying the Sunnah al muakkada the 12 Sunnah prayers. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about these 12 Sunnah prayers, a house will be built in paradise for every Muslim who offers 12 rak'ahs of optional salah other than the obligatory salah in the day and night to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these 12 Sunnah prayers are two before, sun, uh, two before Fajr, Four before Dhuhr and two after Dhuhr, two after the Maghrib prayer and two after the Isha prayer. These are the 12 sunnahs the hadith is talking about. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said specifically about the two rak'ahs before Fajr. He said, Rak'ataini qabla al-Fajr khayrun min al-dunya wa ma fiha. Imagine, sisters, we crave for the best of everything. We want the best in this world, right? Your Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, two rak'ahs, two units of prayer before fajr is better than the dunya and everything in it. <coughs> also besides these 12 sunnah prayers is the witr prayer. It was mentioned from Abu Huraira radiallahu an, who said, my Khalil, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, advised me with three affairs. 
and I will not leave them until I die. He said to fast three days of every month, to offer the duha prayer, and to pray the witr prayer before sleeping. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in being consistent with them. One of the sisters mentioned in the chats that I should repeat the 12 sunnah prayers. So what are the 12 rak'ahs? Starting with the fajr prayer. So it's two rak'ahs before the fajr prayer. Four rak'ahs before dhuhr. And two after dhuhr. And two after maghrib. And two after isha. And if one does this, what is the reward? Rasulullah said, a house will be built in paradise for every Muslim who offered these 12 rakahs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us being consistent with them. Moving on to the next point, that is lots of dua and dhikr. Dua is the weapon of the believer. Let's make the most of this weapon especially in this blessed month. Cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beg him, ask him for everything and anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Baqarah was, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah said in verse number 186, when my servant asks about me, tell them I am near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is right there. He's so close to us. Allah says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to him than the jugular vein. That's how close Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to us. So during the night, you don't just go to your bedroom, lock the door. Remove your prayer mat and pour out your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Du'as is one of the strongest means to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if not in Ramadan, if not in these last 10 blessed nights, then when sisters? Now coming to dhikr, that there is a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's try hard to keep our tongue moist, the remembrance of Allah azza wa jal. So whether you're preparing iftar or just clearing up the kitchen, try hard to keep your tongue busy with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To subhanallah wa bihamdi, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh, la ilaha illallah, continuously. The hadith mentions, whoever says subhanallah wa bihamdi, a date palm tree will be planted for him. How many trees do you think we can plant in a minute? Yes, it's that easy, subhanAllah. Sisters, this is the month of blessings. This is the month the gates of Jannah are open. This is the month the gates of, the, the gates of Jahannam are, are closed. It's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us everything. He's literally giving us everything in a platter. And then he's telling us, here it is. I give it to you. I made it so easy for you. Get closer to me. Do a good deed so that you can enter Jannah. Let's not get overtaken by our laziness. We have less than a week of Ramadan in front of us. Let's try hard to give it up us, our best. Another hadith mentions, whoever says, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Whoever says this dua, what do you think is the reward? Whoever says so, 100 times in one day, then it is equivalent to him freeing 10 slaves, and a 100 good deeds are written for him. And a hundred bad deeds are, yeah, are erased. And it is a protection for him against shaitan during that day until the evening. And no one comes with a better deed than him. 
except for the man who does more actions than him. That is, except for a man who has recited more than what this man has recited. So, la ilaha illallah wa wahdahu la sharika lah. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Reciting this dua hundred times a day. Moving on to the next point that is drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the taraweeh and the tahajjud in the last one third of the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Sajda, verse number 16, تَتَّجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا غَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Their sides forsake their beds to invoke their Lord in fear and hope and they spend in charity in Allah's cause out of what we have bestowed on them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Lord descends every night to the lowest heaven when one third of the night remains and says, who will call upon me that I may answer him? Who will ask of me that I may forgive him? Who will seek my forgiveness that I might pardon him? And who will ask of me that I may give him? Imagine Allah descends to the lowest heaven and asks us, it's an open invitation from Allah. You want to seek forgiveness? Here I am. You want to repent? Here I am. You want to ask for anything? I'm right there. So let's try hard to hold on to this blessed opportunity at this blessed time of the night. Now the best dua of these last 10 nights are Allahumma innaka afu wan tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anhu. Aisha radiallahu anha reported, I asked, O Messenger of Allah, if I realize Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, what should I supplicate in it? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, you should supplicate and say, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anni. That, O oh Allah, you are the most forgiving and you love forgiveness. So forgive me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibreel said to me, may Allah rub his toe, rub his nose in the dust. That person to whom Ramadan comes and his sins are not forgiven. He hasn't done enough to gain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. His du'as don't shake the skies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna rahmatallahi qareebun min al-muhsineen. Allah's mercy is close to the doers of good. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, in Ramadan he would finish the Quran every day. Yes, every single day. And then there were some who finished the Quran every week and some who finish the Qur'an every three days. Imam Zuhri and Imam Sufyan bin Thawri, they wouldn't engage in conversations with people during this holy month. It was just the Qur'an. They lived with the Qur'an. This is how they were, radiyallahu anhum wa rabahum. They loved the Qur'an. They loved reading it, pondering over it and understanding it. These last 10 nights of Ramadan are the best nights of Ramadan. And they are the best nights of the year too. Allah says, Laylatul Qadr min alfi shahr. Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months, better than 83 years of worship. Search for them in the odd nights of Ramadan, the 21st, the 23rd, the 25th, the 27th, as well as the 29th. There's a difference of opinion on which night it is exactly. But Rasulullah told us to search for it in these odd nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. Indeed, we send the Quran down during the night of decree. And what can make you know what is the night of decree? Laylatul qadri khayrun min alfi shahar. The night of decree 
is better than a thousand months. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ سَلَامٌ هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْلَعِ الْفَجْرِ The angels and the spirit descend therein by permission of their Lord for every matter. Peace it is until the emergence of dawn. In these days, sisters, we have to increase in our good deeds. So say, for example, if you read a juz every day in Ramadan, if you read one juz of the Quran in the first 20 days of Ramadan, increase it in the last 10 days, in the last 10 nights. So read maybe one and a half juz to watch sir, in these last 10 nights. If you remember Allah saying, subhanallah wa bihamdih, astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayh, a certain amount of times in the first 20 days of Ramadan, increase it in these last 10 nights. Increase and multiply your good deeds. Also alternate between them so that you remain focused. So salah, dua, dhikr, as well as subhan. In a race, when you are finished, when you are reaching the finish line, you hasten to defeat the ones next to you, right? The same way in Ramadan, as we reach the end, let's hasten towards good deeds. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَسَابِقُوا Imam Ahmad rahimahullah was asked, O oh, Imam, what do you see about a people who when Ramadan approached them, they worshipped Allah? But when Ramadan got over, when Ramadan left them, they returned to what they were before Ramadan. He said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ هَؤُلَاء عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَلَيْسُ عِبَادِ لِرَبِّ رَمَضَانِ He said that I seek refuge from Allah. They are the worshippers of Ramadan, not the worshippers of the Lord of Ramadan. Meaning the fear, love, hope, and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only for Ramadan. عِبَادُ رَمَضَانِ وَلَيْسُوا عِبَادُ لِرَبِّ رَمَضَانِ Ramadan was established so that we get the connection with Allah. We love him more, follow his commandments more in Ramadan and continue them after Ramadan. Ramadan was established so that you pray Salatul Witr, so that you read the Quran, so that you give Sadaqah, so that you draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ that is, if you finished one ibadah, one good deed, head to the second one and turn to your Lord in seeking his forgiveness and mercy, goodness and acceptance. Lastly, and I would like to end with this, is let's try to amplify our good deeds. Let's try to combine intentions as we do all these good deeds. So for example, I'll just mention three to four deeds that we can do having multiple intentions. So for example, salah. When we stand for salah, these are some of the intentions we could have. Number one, to gain the love of Allah Azza wa Jal. Number two, to follow his commandments. To follow the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To save yourself from the fire. To practice khushur to cry in salah, to purify the heart, to exercise the body, to engage in contemplation of the Quran and the reality of life and death, and to revise your Quran. When one of the sisters mentioned in the comment section that what is khushur? Khushur is to have this focus during salah and to understand and contemplate and ponder over what you're reciting during salah. Another date, for example, fasting. These are some of the intentions we could have. To attain the law of Allah. The same to follow his commandments, to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To attain taqwa, that is piety. To keep away from the hellfire to enter paradise from the special door that is through Babu Rayyan, to experience the plight of the poor, 
to fight desires, to have our breath more fragrant to Allah than musk, to have suhoor, to hasten and break from the fast, to increase in good acts during the day, to develop character and willpower. Moving on to Quran, when we are reading the Quran, these are some of the intentions we could have. Point number one, two, three, to attain the love of Allah, to follow his commandments and to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These three points, we could combine these intentions for any good deed that we are going to do. And also to attain taqwa, to keep away from the hellfire, to get rewarded for every letter that we recite, to convey, even if it be just one verse, to increase in knowledge of the tafsir of the Quran, to, res to be resurrected on the day of judgment as a qari and a memorizer and to rise with every verse in Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. To have our parents honored on the day of judgment, to improve our station in salah. So we can amplify our rewards with, with having these multiple intentions, inshallah. And we can do this with every single act of good deed. We are anyways doing the good deed, right, sisters? So why not have multiple intentions and make it heavier in a scale of good deeds? I pray and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he gathered us here today for no worldly cause except for his pleasure to gather us on the day of judgment in the Malik and Muqtadir. Allahumma taqabbal siyamana wa qiyamana wa saliha a'malina. Allahumma ja'al siyamana fihi siyam al-sa'imeen wa qiyamana fihi qiyam al-qa'imeen. اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار وصل اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Thank you أستاذة زكرى Without um, wasting more time, I would now pass it on to Ustazah Ratiba to continue with the next presentation entitled The Advice of Luqman Al-Hakim. Just give me time to put on the slides. You can proceed with the presentation, Ustaz Ratiba. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic of my talk is the advice of Luqman al-Hakim We all know that there is a surah named Luqman in the Quran, and it's named after him, that is Luqman al-Hakim. And before we dive into the interesting verses related to him, the first question that arises is that who is Luqman? Who is Luqman? Was he a prophet of Allah? Or was he just a righteous man to whom Allah had granted a lot of wisdom? 
There is difference of opinion when it comes to who Luqman was. The scholars, they differ, but the correct opinion is that he was not a prophet. He was a pious man who Allah had granted wisdom to. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he mentions in his tafsir that Luqman was a freed slave from Abyssinia. And he says that once a man asked, asked Luqman, aren't you the slave of so-and-so who used to look after my sheep not so long in the past? So Luqman uh, replies and says, yes. And then the man said, what raised you to this high status that I see? Luqman said, Sidq al-Hadith wa ada'u al-Amana and wa tark ma la ya'inuni. The divine decree, repaying the trust and telling the truth and discarding and keeping away from what does not concern me. And we know from the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wherein he says that there are three signs of a hypocrite. When he speaks, he lies. And he, when he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he's entrusted, he betrays his trust. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another hadith, عَلَيْكُمْ بِالصِّدْقِ فَإِنَّ الصِّدْقَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْبِرِّ وَإِنَّ الْبِرَّ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ يَصْدُقُ حَتَّى يُكْتَبَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ صِدِّيقًا You must be truthful. Truthfulness leads to dutifulness. And dutifulness, it leads to paradise. And a man continues to tell the truth until he is written as a Siddiq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam further said, Beware of lying. Lying leads to deviance, and deviance leads to the fire. A man continues to lie until he is written as a liar with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what raised Luqman to his high status? He said, these are the traits that, traits that because of which he attained this state, high status amongst men. That is, telling the truth, the divine decree, repaying the trust and keeping away from what does not concern him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Luqman, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ يَشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Indeed, we blessed Luqman with wisdom saying, Be grateful to Allah. For whoever is grateful, it is only for their own good. And whoever is ungrateful, then surely Allah is self-sufficient and praiseworthy. What is hikmah? The scholars, they define it as al-hikmah to wada'u shay fi mahallihi. It is placing everything in the right place. Doing the right thing at the right time, in the right place, in the right method. That is hikmah. And Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ He gives wisdom to whoever he wills. And whoever has been given wisdom has certainly been given so much of good. And none will remember except those of understanding. So Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ يَشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ Indeed, we blessed Luqman with wisdom, saying, Be grateful to Allah. For whoever is grateful, it is only for their own good. Means, we commanded him to give thanks to Allah for the blessings and the favors that Allah had given to him among his people and contemporaries. He commanded him to be grateful, to do shukr. And the first and the greatest way of showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to acknowledge that everything you have is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Every blessing is from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُودَ شُكْرًا وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورٌ Give thanks, O house of Dawood, yet only a few of my worshippers are thankful. And do you know what Dawood replied to this when Allah commanded him to be grateful? 
it comes in the tafsir of this ayah. He says, وَكَيْفَ أَشْكُرُكَ يَا, يَا اللَّهِ وَقَدْ أَلْهَمْتَنِي بِنِعْمَةِ الشُّكْرِ How can I thank you, O Allah, when you were the one who granted me the blessing of thanking you? So Dawud alayhi salam, he said, How can I thank you, O Allah, when you were the one who granted me the blessing of thanking you? When you were the one who granted me the blessing of being grateful to you? You are able to thank Allah. You are able to be grateful to Allah. That's a ni'mah itself. Acknowledging the blessings of Allah. Just to understand shukr and alhamd better, we have two different words for, for being grateful uh, that are related to shukr, that are related to gratefulness in the Quran. That is alhamd and shukr. Do they mean the same thing? The ulama, they differ, the, they differentiate these words. And they say that alhamd, it is translated as praise. And they say that hamd is more comprehensive than shukr. And it is not just restricted to praise. They say that alhamd is you're praising Allah and you're thanking him, being grateful to him with ta'zeem and mahabba, with love and glorification for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as shukr, it is more specific. Therefore, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَثَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ For whoever is grateful, it is only for their own good. And whoever is ungrateful, then surely Allah is self-sufficient and praiseworthy. It only benefits you when you're grateful to Allah. Allah is self-sufficient and praiseworthy. He, does not, he doesn't need us. He owns everything. Every single thing belongs to him, including us human beings. We are the ones who need him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Nisa, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا Why should Allah punish you if you have thanked him and have believed in him? And Allah is ever all appreciative of good and all knowing. That's all that Allah wants from us. Further in Surah Luqman, Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِيهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٍ عَظِيمٍ And when Luqman said to his son, while he admonished him, O oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Most surely, associating partners with Allah, doing shirk, is a grievous sin. And maw'idha, this word maw'idha, it means that it means admonishing. It is translated as admonishing. And it is when you advise someone with instilling love, hope, and fear in them. You're admonishing them, but with love and softness. And you're instilling fear in them, but with hope. That's how he addressed his son, giving him the knowledge that he has, that he had. When he's teaching him, he's starting with the foundation of everything, the most important thing that is tawheed verily shirk is the most evil deed and Allah can forgive anything except shirk and the verse of Surah An-Nisa says إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ whoever joins others with Allah associates past partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship Allah will forbid him the garden 
the paradise, and the fire will be his abode. There will be there for the wrongdoers will be no one to help. And the next verse of Surah Luqman, it talks about the relationship with the parents. And after the relationship with Allah and the right of Allah, he Luqman, he advises his son about the relationship with the parents. But the ulama, they differ regarding these two next verses of Surah Luqman, whether they are what Luqman said, or it is Allah who mentioned them here because they suit here this, uh, and the situation. Allah says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِ اشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ And we have commanded people to honor their parents. Their mothers, their mothers uh, bore them through hardship upon hardship and their weaning took, takes two years. So be grateful to me and to your parents. To me is the final return. Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah, he says, Man salla salawat al-khams, faqad shakar Allah. Wa man da'a li walidayhi adbar salawat al-khams, faqad shakar li walidayhi. Whoever has performed the five daily prayers properly, he has shown gratitude to Allah, has been grateful to Allah. And whoever makes dua for his parents after these five daily prayers, then he has been grateful to his parents. It is being grateful to Allah for the ni'mah of Islam, for, be, for guiding us, and being grateful to your parents for the tarbiyah, for bringing you up, nurturing you upon Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, رِضَ اللَّهِ فِي رِضَ الْوَالِدَيْنِ وَسَخَطَ اللَّهِ فِي سَخَطِ الْوَالِدَيْنِ The pleasure of Allah is in the pleasure of the parents, and the anger of Allah is in the anger of the parents. Allah further says, وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا But if they strive with you to make you join and worship others besides Allah, that of which you have no knowledge, then obey them not. Means if they try to make you follow something else besides Islam, some other religion besides Islam, then do not accept that from them. But do not let them that, but do not let that to stop, stop you from behaving with them in the world kindly. That is treating them with respect and kindness. And follow the path of who of him who turns to me in repentance and in obedience, meaning the believers. Then to me will be your return, and I shall tell you what you used to do. At Tabrani, he recorded, he recorded in his tafsir, and he said that Sa'ad ibn Malik radiallahu anh, he said when this ayah was revealed, that he, it, was, it was revealed concerning him. Because he had accepted Islam, and he was known, he was a man who was known to honor his mother. But when he became Muslim, she said to him, O oh, Sa'ad, what is this new thing I see you doing leaving this religion of yours? Or if you do not leave this religion of yours, I will not eat or drink until I die. And people will say, shame on you, on you, O Sa'ad, for you, for what you have done to, for what you have done to your mother, they will say that. And you have killed your mother. So Sa'ad ibn Malik, radiallahu anh, he said, do not do that, O mother for I will not give up this religion of mine for anything. She says, so she stayed without eating for one day and one night, and she became exhausted. Then she stayed for another day and night without eating, and she became utterly exhausted. And when Sa'ad ibn Malik radiallahu an, he saw that, he said, Oh my mother, by Allah, even if you had 100 souls and they were to depart one by one, I would not give up this religion of mine for anything. So if you want to eat, eat. And if you do not want to eat, then do not eat. Sa'ad ibn Malik radiallahu anh, he was known to honor his mother. He was always kind and he respected his mother a lot. But when, he, when it came to tawheed, when it came to worshiping Allah, he would not give up his iman and his religion. 
So it sometimes it gets difficult with the parents, especially for the new Muslims who have ex- who just accepted Islam and their parents are yet non-Muslims. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ." And follow the path of whom who he, who turns to me in repentance and in obedience, then to me will be your final return. Allah and the ulama they try, they they say the uh, in the tafsir of this ayah that when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says ثم إلى يمرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون is that uh, the next verse of Surah Luqman it says وإن جاهدك على أن تشرك بما ليس لك when Allah says ثم أنبئ uh, uh, ثم إلى يمرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you generously for that, for being patient with your parents, for being kind to them, even though they tried to, uh, to make you leave the religion of Islam. And the people of Jannah, they say, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّ الْحَزَلِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ All praises and thanks be to Allah who has removed from us all grief meaning the grief of this world. Verily, our Lord is indeed oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate good deeds and to recompense. Insha'Allah, we'll be dealing with the next uh, verses of Surah Luqman in the next session. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, to increase us in knowledge and to grant us wisdom. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to be grateful to him and to his parents. In this month of acceptance and forgiveness. May Allah accept all, all the du'as that we make and all the du'as that our parents make for us. And may Allah forgive us for the times we have been ungrateful to him and to our parents. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ وَعَلَيْكُمْ وَسَلَامُ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَبَرَكَاتُهُ Thank you, Ustazah Ratiba. Next, you will have Ustazah Rushta. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. Just uh, give me a few minutes, please. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to share my screen.
sorry for the delay. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassid li amri wa hlul qadam min lisani fqaw qawli. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma inna nasaluka al-ikhlasa fil qawli wal-amal. Oh Allah, we ask you for sincerity in word and deed. And we ask that you accept of us all the efforts that we make in these blessed days of Ramadan. Allah has what Jah says in the Quran in Surah Al Hashr, chapter 59, verse 9, as well as in Surah Al Taqabun, um, verse 16, Allah says, Huma yuqa shuha nafsi, faula ikahum al muflihun. And whoever is saved from the covetousness of his own soul, it is they who are the successful ones. Whoever is saved from the stinginess of his own soul, it is they who are the successful ones. Now, what does the greed or the, or the stinginess of one's own soul really mean? In the verse before this, in the preceding verse in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah Azza wa Jal talks about how the Muhajirun fled their homes only for the sake of Allah and migrated from Makkah to Medina. And in this verse, Allah says, in the beginning of this verse, Allah talks about the Ansar. And he says, and when the Muhajirun fled their homes after facing persecution from their people, the Ansar welcomed them with open arms. They welcomed them as their own people, as their own sisters and brothers. And they shared with them their wealth and their land and their possessions, despite being poverty stricken themselves. And Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the, the Ansar and the extent of their um, selflessness. And he says, And those who before them had homes in al Madina and adopted the faith, that is the Ansar. Allah is talking about the Ansar here. And those who before them had homes in al Madina and adopted the faith, they love those who fled to them for refuge, they love the muhajirin. And they find no desire in their hearts for things given to the latter. Allah is saying that the Ansar had no resentment in their hearts for the muhajirin because of the war booty that Rasulullah gave them. The hearts are pure, the hearts are free of jealousy. And not just that, Allah continues, this is the beauty of the relationship between the Ansar and the Muhajirin. Allah says, they give the Muhajirin preference over themselves, even though poverty was their own lot. The Ansar were poor themselves, yet they sacrificed whatever little they had for their brothers in faith. And then Allah Azza wa Jal ends this beautiful narrative with the words, and whoever is saved from the covetousness of his own soul, it is they who are the successful. And this is the theme of um, our discussion today, inshallah. So in this verse, Allah Azza wa Jal praises the Ansar for the great sacrifices that they made for their brothers in faith and for how they gave so freely of themselves without clinging on to the material gains of this world. Allah concludes by saying that the successful people, Allah concludes this ayah by saying that the successful people are those who are protected from the shuh, from the covetousness, from the greed, the stinginess of their own souls. Now, shuh can be many things. Your reluctance to part with wealth when asked to spend it in the way of Allah, a reluctance to do that, or to compete over the amassment of worldly things for no greater purpose than showing off. I want a better watch. I want a better phone, a better car. To get so caught up in the web of this dunya, in the rat race, to focus on these things so much that we lose sight of our true purpose in this world. But shuh is not just about covetousness in terms of material things. You know that, that fleeting twinge of bitterness that you, you, you may experience when you hear of your friend's success? That is shuh. Your unwillingness to change your opinion or to admit to your mistake because it hurts your ego, that is sure. Your reluctance to uh, apologize to someone whom you perceive is less than you, that is sure too. 
your reluctance to share the knowledge that you have learned with others or to utilize your talents in the way of Allah is sure. Because all of these things, knowledge, skills, wealth, they're all blessings, right? They're ni'mah of Allah. And to withhold them from other people or to withhold from spending them in the way of Allah is to be stingy. It is sure. Holding resentments in your heart is part of sure. Grudges. Envy is sure. Selfishness is sure. Sure is about giving in to your desires again and again every time they contradict with Allah's commands. And Allah is telling us twice in the Quran, in these two separate verses, Allah says the exact same thing, that the successful people are those who are saved from the covetousness of their souls. Humul muflihun. Who are the successful ones? Those who are saved from the shur of their souls. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us of them. I mean, now, um, what does it mean to be protected from shur? How can we overcome or overpower the shur of our souls? When Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the Ansar in this verse, what does he say? He says, They don't find in their breasts, in their hearts, any desire for the things that were given to the muhajireen. They don't find in their hearts any sort of resentment or grudge against the muhajireen. Their hearts are free of bitterness and jealousy and envy. And that is what is meant by richness of the heart, contentment. Because if you're not burdened by these, by the weight of envy and jealousy, your heart will be light, right? You will be rich at heart. Rasulullah was once sitting with his companions in the masjid and he told them, a man from the people of Jannah will show up now. And the Sahabat Allah and all of them looked around and a man from the Ansar walked in. Now, this man is not a Sahabi that we know of, right? He, he's obscure. His name is not even mentioned in the books of Hadith. The next day, Rasulullah said, a man from the people of Jannah will show up now. And the same man came in. On the third day, the same thing happened. Rasulullah is sitting with his companions and he says, a man from the people of Jannah will show up now. And the same man walks in. Three days in a row. Now, Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As is sitting with Rasulullah in, in this gathering of the Sahaba and he wants to know what's special about this man. So after Rasulullah stands up to leave, he follows this man out and he tells him, I had an argument with my father and I took an oath that I wouldn't enter my house for three days. So can I stay with you? And the man says, yeah, sure, you're welcome. Now, Abdullah bin Amr bin al he wants to see the private life of this man. He wants to know what's so special about him, right? What makes him a man of Jannah? What's so special about him that Rasulullah said three days in a row that this is a man from Jannah? And subhanAllah, this tells you how eager the Sahaba were to learn and to do good and to strive for self-betterment. And when they competed with each other, they did so for the sake of Allah. And there was no resentment in their hearts when they did it. So, uh, so Abdullah bin Amr, he comes to know that this is a man of Jannah and he wants to learn from him. He wants to know what he can do to emulate him. And this also tells us about the, the humbleness of these great men. Abdullah bin Amr bin Rahas is a well-known companion, right? And yet he's so desperate to learn from this unknown man. So Abdullah stays with this man for three days. And he expects to find him praying all night because he's a man from Jannah. Because he's so special, right? He's promised paradise. But come night time and the man goes to sleep. And he wakes up only for a few minutes before Fajr and he prays a few rakat of Qiyam. So Abdullah bin Amr is surprised because he's a man who, who stays up all night to pray. And then he expects the man to fast. But the man has breakfast. Abdullah bin Amr is trying to figure out what's special about this man. He thinks, okay, maybe he'll do it um, tomorrow because he's probably just tired today. Maybe today's an exception. But the next day, the man goes to sleep again and he doesn't fast either. And the third night, the same thing happens. Now, Abdullah bin Amr bin Aas is very confused because he's a person who recites the entire Quran in three nights. He's wondering what makes this man so special? So eventually he goes up to him and he says, look, I didn't really have any issues with my father. I didn't have any problems. I just wanted to see what's special about you because Rasulullah told us that you are in Jannah thrice. So tell me what's so special about you because to be honest, I didn't really find anything special about you. And the man says, there's nothing to my life other than what you've seen. 
And Abdullah bin Amr is obviously very disappointed and he turns to leave. And then the man calls him back, he says, come here. There's nothing more than what you have seen, except one thing. Before the day ends, before I go to bed each night, I make sure that there is no hatred or resentment or envy in my heart for any Muslim. I empty my heart of all grudges. Abdullah bin Amr says, that's it. This is what led you to achieve your special status. And this is what we are unable to do. So it was this man's purity of heart, his lack of resentment, how, how he managed to overpower the shuh of his own soul that earned him this, uh, this special status and his place in Jannah. It wasn't any external act. It was internal. So these are the keys to Jannah. And while shuh leads to ingratitude and narrow-mindedness and a constant worry over the dunya, overpowering it leads to gratefulness, open-mindedness, and a sense of contentment. So how can we overcome the shuh of our souls? What does this look like in practice? Some of the ways that we can fight the shuh of our souls. Number one, reminding ourselves that this dunya is fleeting, reminding ourselves of the transient nature of this world. If we bear in mind that this dunya is temporary, then we won't chase wealth and prestige and the luxuries of this world in, over the year after. We will be more, we will spend more freely in the way of Allah because we're striving for the everlasting home, for the home of the year after. And that makes everything in this dunya seem so insignificant, right? And so unworthy of our attention. And this is in Surah Al-Ankabut. Verse 64, Allah says, وَمَا هَذِي الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهِبٌ وَلَهُ and this worldly life is nothing but diversion and amusement. And indeed, the home of the year after, that is the eternal life. If only they knew. Number two is constantly reminding ourselves to, to, to be grateful to Allah. Constantly remind yourself to, to show gratitude to Allah explicitly with your tongue and through your deeds, no matter the circumstances. Because Allah says, He has given you of all that you asked for. And if you count the favors of Allah, never will you be able to number them. This verse in Surah Ibrahim. Verily, man is most unjust and ungrateful. Think of the many blessings that we take for granted. Blessings that others who are less fortunate are praying for right now. There are people in war-torn lands who have lost their families, their homes, and they would give anything to be in your place and in my place right now. So thank Allah Azza wa for the blessings that he has given you without you even asking for them. Allah says, And remember when your Lord proclaimed, if you are grateful, I will certainly increase you in favor. This is basically the prescription for rizq, for getting more of, of the things that you want for. Allah says, if you are Grateful for the things that I have given you right now, Allah will increase you. So if la in shakartum la azid and nakum, wala in kafartum in la shadid. But if you are thankless, if you're not grateful, then indeed my punishment is severe. Number three, stop comparing your blessings to the blessings of those around you of others whom you perceive are better off than you. Free yourselves from these toxic comparisons, from these poisonous comparisons, and look instead to those who are less fortunate than you. Look at those who are less fortunate than you. Rasulullah SAW said, look at those below you, that is, those who are less fortunate than you, and don't look at those above you, for it is the best way not to belittle the favors that Allah has bestowed on you. Number four, Try to be happy for, for others. Realize that the success of other people does not take away from your own. This is not some zero-sum game where 
for you to be successful, others have to fail. Rasulullah said, none of you has truly believed until he likes for his brother what he likes for himself. If you like for your fellow Muslim brother what you like for yourself, then their success will make you happy, right? In fact, try to learn from those whom you envy for their success. Ask them how they did it. Try to copy their positive habits so you can achieve what they did rather than um, having it impact you in an unhealthy way. Try to use it for self-betterment to improve your own self. And if you find yourself being envious or resentful of people, make dua for them. That will help you fight the envy and the jealousy. Rasulullah said, the supplication of a Muslim for his brother in his absence will certainly be answered. Every time he makes a supplication for good for his brother, the angel appointed for his uh, for this particular task says, I mean, and may it be for you too. So if you make dua for others, and if you try to be happy for them, Allah will increase you in your own favors, in your own blessings. Number five, spend more in the way of Allah. And this follows from the first point, which is to remind ourselves of the temporary nature of this dunya, spending in the way of Allah. And there's two important things to keep in mind when it comes to spending in the way of Allah. And uh, this includes, by the way, um, helping others, uh, spending time, money, effort, whatever it is, right? So spending in the way of Allah. The first thing is don't expect anything in return from them. Give freely of yourself to others without expecting anything in return. Do it solely for the sake of Allah. In Surah Al-Insan, Allah Azza wa talks about uh, the people of Jannah. And he says that in this dunya, they used to feed the poor saying, we feed you for the sake of Allah alone. We wish not from you any reward or thanks. So these are the hallmarks of the people of Jannah. They give others, they give of themselves without expecting anything in return from the people whom they help. These people know that their reward lies with Allah. When they serve people, they expect nothing from them in return. And we should apply this to anything, any favors that we do for other people. And oftentimes we catch ourselves thinking, man, I did so much for her. Or I did so much for him, right? And he couldn't even do this for me. Or I wish that she would have at least thanked me, right? But Allah tells us that these people, the people of Jannah, don't desire anything in return. Their intentions are pure. They're doing it solely for the sake of Allah. And may Allah as well make us of them. And the second point to remember when spending in the way of Allah is to spend out of that which you love. Allah says, Never shall you attain al-bir. Never shall you attain righteousness until you spend out of that which you love. Because if we love Allah, then we will sacrifice what we love for his sake. Because true love comes with sacrifice. And the people of Jannah that Allah Azza wa Jalla describes in the verse I mentioned before this from Surah Al-Insan. Um, in the preceding verse, Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us about them. He says, That they give food in spite of their love for it to the poor and the orphans and the needy. Allah is saying that they are in need of this food. They're hungry themselves, and yet they spend out of it to give others. So these are the people who have fulfilled both of these things. They spend for the sake of Allah alone, and they spend out of that which they love and need. Rasulullah was asked which um, which sadaqah is the best? What type of sadaqah is the best? And he replied that you should give Sadaqa, while you are healthy and close fisted, haunted by the fear of poverty and hoping to become rich. The Ansar of the Law Anhum, Allah says, they, they gave the Muhajireen preference over themselves, even though they were poor. They shared their wealth and their homes with the immigrants ever so selflessly. And Allah has promised us in a hadith. Um, in a hadith Qudsi, Rasulullah said that Allah said, 
spend, O son of Adam, in charity, and I will spend on you. So this is the promise of Allah, that charity does not reduce your wealth or your blessings, but increases them. And Allah will give you rizq if you, were to sp if you spend in this way. And Allah will bless your wealth for you if you do that. Allah says, Whatever you spend in his way, whatever you do, whatever you spend, he will replace it for you. So as Muslims, we don't restrain ourselves to the physical nature of this material world. We have full conviction that Allah Azza wa will give us of his limitless bounty. Number six, keep yourself spiritually connected. Reading the Quran and reflecting over its verses, learning about the lifestyle of Rasulullah and that of his companions, all of that serves as an antidote to the shuh of ourselves, especially in this month of mercy and blessings. The more spiritually connected we are, the less we will be plagued and tormented by the shuh of ourselves. Because the Quran Sunnah, the dhikr of Allah in general, right, is in itself a cure and a healing for all the diseases of the heart. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inu al Barely in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Number seven is to make dua. Make lots of dua. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect you from shuh. Keep your tongue moist with this dua. Ibn Jarir reports in his tafsir that Abu al-Hayyaj al-Asadi said, I was making tawaf around the Kaaba and I saw a man and he was saying, Allahumma qini shuha nafsi. Oh Allah, save me from the stinginess of my soul. Oh Allah, protect me from the stinginess of my soul. And he would say that and he would not add anything else to it. So Abul Hayat says, I asked him, I asked this man about it and he said, if I am protected from the stinginess of my soul, if Allah grants me this one dua of mine, I will not steal, I will not uh, engage in fornication, I will not do anything else that is haram. So if Allah just accepts this one dua of mine, I will be saved from all evil. And this man, and the man who was making this dua, he was Abdul Rahman bin Auf, one of the ten who Rasulullah promised Jannah. Um, so he was constantly making this dua, Allah maqini shurha nafsi. And let's keep our tongue moist with this dua, especially in these blessed nights of Ramadan. So let's remind ourselves every time we feel hesitant to spend of our wealth or our time or our efforts in the way of Allah to help others. Let's remind ourselves of this verse. Whoever is saved from the stinginess of their souls, it is they who are the successful ones. Every time we feel a bout of envy or jealousy, let's remind ourselves of this verse. Every time we're overcome by greed or lust or desire that that tempts us to do other than what pleases Allah, let's remind ourselves. Whoever saved from the covetousness, from the greed of their own souls, it is they who are the successful ones. This is the simple prescription for success. This is the gateway to contentment and to happiness. We ask Allah Azza wa in these blessed days of Ramadan to protect us from the shuh of our nafs, Allahumma qina shuh and fusina, and to grant us a nafs that is tranquil, a nafs mutma'inna, and to make us of those whom Allah Azza wa Jal will call out to on the last day, saying, Ya ayyatu wa nafsul mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya, O reassured soul, come back unto your Lord, content in his good pleasure. Fatukhli fi ibadi, watukhli jannati, enter then among my honored slaves, and enter my paradise. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Ustazah Rushta.
Thank you again, once again to Ustazah Zikra, Ustazah Ratibah, and once again to Ustazah Rushta. Um, just a few um, uh, announcements. Um, the Sunday weekly classes that we normally have um, will resume a few weeks after Eid. So um, with that, I think um, let's just make dua that Allah grant us the opportunity to meet with Laylatul Qadar and be rewarded abundantly. I mean, and um, let's have a blessed final few days of Ramadan and may we double and triple our effort to, to, to ask for Allah for his mercy and his blessings. And before we end, on behalf of all the Ustazas, um, we would like to apologize for the technical glitches that happened during the session today. Please be informed that um, all the Ustazas are broadcasting, including my, myself as a host. We are broadcasting from three different countries. So different countries have different in internet connection ability. So some countries, the internet is quite poor. So we apologize deeply for the glitches. Um, the recording of the session will be made available on the Facebook pages of Usaza Farhat as well as the Facebook page of Aris Training. So you can go back to listen to the recording and if there's any clarification that you need, you can type out and inshallah, we will try to get back to you with your questions. So till we meet again, may Allah protect us all. Um, and Alhamdulillah, I think we should say a lot of thanks to Allah for even though we are broadcasting from three different countries with all the technical glitches, we are still able to be together in this session of ilm. And may Allah um, reward us abundantly for this effort, inshallah. Till we meet again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.